at any point if I lost connection, uh, uh, I'll try to. Call the problem you. is that I cannot uh, check Skype uh, during the yeah, talk. Someone, so typically, someone will be next to the laptop and checking that we are still working. It's the same, it, but it's the same laptop. That's the problem. That's why yeah, I do share. Yeah, you have some of your friends. From every five minutes, you every, <laughs> every every five minutes you can cough or something. <laughs> something like that should, should be great. Okay, hopefully I'm not gonna. If if you lost connection, please try to call me back. So uh, let me see. That's what we were saying. There. Okay, good. Okay, so I think we will start. I think most of the people are here. Let me do an introduction. Okay. Okay, so I'm Arset Vona. Uh, this is my student, Dimitrios Kanoulos. He will do his PhD defense today. Uh, his committee is Guevara Nobir, joining us by Skype uh, from England, I believe. Uh, Songkuk Yoon from SRI in California, and Professor Rob Flat here. I just want to give a little brief history of Dimitrios. Dimitrios comes from Greece. Um, he came here in 2008. Uh, he was originally working in game theory with uh, Rajmohan and Ravi. Uh, he started working with me uh, in 2009-2010. Um, he did an internship at INRIA in France, and he has been accepted for a postdoc position that will start in September, provided that he successfully defends um, <laughs> at the Italian Institute of Technology with uh, Nikos Sikrakis. Uh, so he will talk for 50 minutes, then we will have open questions, then we will have a closed session where only the faculty and the candidate are present. Uh, and that will so with that, okay. Go ahead. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, you are a lot of people. Okay, cool. So I'm Dimitris Kanulas. For those that they don't know me, I don't see anyone that doesn't know me here. So you probably will know me. Uh, and thanks for coming to my PhD defense on curved surface passes for rafter and perception. So what we are interested in. Uh, is 3D perception for contact in rafter end. And the main hypothesis that I'm going to try to prove you today is that robots that operating in unstructured environments need to perceive areas for potential contact. And these areas can be detected and modeled using curved surface patches, and they can also specially map in real time. For the special case of footfall conducts, which we are really interested in, we need to detect uh, these bounded curved surface patches for contact in the same scale as the robot's foot in the environment. So the system that we designed through all these years is, is a, a 3D perception system and it's divided in, in two parts, in two big parts. The upper part is the perception part. So the upper part is responsible of finding these bounded curved patches, uh, which are uh, co uh, for contact, potentially good contact areas between the robot and the environment. And this is my main focus in this thesis. And the lower part, which is a simple, a simple control part, is uh, responsible of getting these potentially good patches, finding the best one that the robot could use for um, locomotion and using a library of these patches running the corresponding uh, motion sequence of the robot and this is what I'm going to explain you uh, today so before I start I believe these are the five contributions of, uh, of my thesis uh, first of all we introduced a new sparse environment surface representation using the bounded curve patches uh, for modeling contact between the robot and the environment. We introduced a fast algorithm to fit this kind of, uh, of models, this kind of patches in the environment, uh, considering uncertainty. We have ways to evaluate this kind of fitting, fast ways to evaluate this fitting. We introduced bunch part methods for finding these patches similar to what humans are finding in the environment when they're locomoting. And finally, we introduce a real-time mapping system uh, for um, a walking biped uh, application. And this is what I'm going to go through uh, this thesis. 
So this is my outline. I'm going to start with some related work. I'm going to um, talk about the first part, which is the, the, how we model the surface. Uh, and then I'm going to continue of how we use this modeling for creating a dynamic map around the robot. And I'm going to conclude with some uh, future work. So the related work first. First of all, why, why bipedal robots? Uh, you know, bipedal robots need to replace humans in dangerous tasks. You can think of Fukushima as an example, and they operate in human traverse of the rough terrain. Over the last few years, there is a rapid advancement in actuation and control, and I'm sure you have seen at least one of these videos. On the left is HRP2, and on the right is uh, Atlas from Boston Dynamics. And this, uh, these are impressive robots. They do locomotion, they don't use vision, as you can see. In particular, with Atlas, it doesn't even have a head. So, <laughs> oh yeah. So, uh, you know, they're capable to do this nice uh, task of locomotion in rough terrain, but under some assumptions. And these assumptions are either the environment is mostly known on well structure, like the one that you see on the left, or uncertainty in the environment can be tolerated with low, uh, low uh, level feedback control, or tactile sensing and proprioception is sufficient for locomotion. But these assumptions, they, uh, they don't always hold in the environment. Think about a robot in front of a big rock and wants to climb on it. It needs perception. It needs vision. And this is what we're going to focus on today. Before, before that, what is perception? Uh, I think we split perception in two parts, extraceptive and proprioceptive. In the, in the extraceptive perception, uh, the robot sends the environment. Uh, using some sensors, for example, rain sensor or tactile sensors. Uh, with proprioceptive, the robot sends its own um, uh, its own state. Um, IMU sensing, for example, for detecting gravity or velocities or its own kinematics. Uh, these are all things that have been used in the literature. What we're going to focus in today is uh, range and IMU sensing. So. What I'm going to uh, assume as input to my algorithms is going to be uh, the input that comes from a range sensor like Kinect, right? Or, a, or any stereo camera. Um, and uh, and uh, we have uh, an IMU attached on the Kinect to bring me. Uh, so this, the Kinect brings a point cloud, a 340 by 480 point cloud in, rea in uh, 30 hertz, 30 frames per second. The IMU gives me, well, I'm going to use only the gravity information from the IMU, IMU that comes uh, 100 times per second. So this is going to be my input. Of course, we are not the only ones that consider uh, perception, theater perception for locomotion. There is work out there. Uh, one impressive uh, set of papers that they were produced between 2008 and 9, and some of them 2010, uh, is with this uh, robot called Little Dog. Uh, is, I guess, the grandparent of Big Dog from Boston Dynamic, though it's much smaller. Um, it was a DARPA challenge. These people, they had their task was to make this uh, four-leg robot to locomote uh, on uh, rough terrain, on rocky environment like that. What you see here in the left video, people were using, they focused more on, again, on control and path planning, which means that they use some motion capture system for uh, having a detailed environment representation and the exact position of the robot in the environment, which are assumptions that we cannot do if we don't have this environment uh, motion capture system that we don't, right? The robot needs to use its own sensors to sense the environment. There is work that people were using stereo cameras to detect the environment and, and make the robot locomote on it, but it's not always working in real time. This is sped up, the videos. And also, it does, it's not designed to reason contact for non-point feet. Note that the robot has spherical feet, which is a single point of contact. What is the state of the art for humanoids uh, for locomotion in 3D perception? You can see it here. Papers from 2012 and 13. Uh, these are the state of the art. What you see here is HRP2 on the left, now on the right, working pretty much on flat environment, with some inclined but flat. And 
again, it's not that always it works in real time. Know that now here is a times pet up. Why is that? There are multiple reasons. First, why, why buy pedal are harder? There are multiple reasons. One is the control imbalance. In general, control imbalance is uh, harder for bipedal. But in the perception part, it seems that the, 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 the way that these people um, represent the environment is by using either some kind of dense volumetric map, like now there, or some dense surface map, triangle meshes, or the point cloud. You see the representation of the, of the environment on the lower uh, left images. And the question is how you can reason contact between a foot and 300,000 points. Of course, again, we're not the first one that thought of ways of representing the environment. There are multiple reasons of why you want to represent the environment with a higher uh, hard degree of, uh, of representation. Uh, there is a lot of work in range image segmentation since 90s. These people wanted to partition the environment in non-overlapping, maybe regular bounded regions. This is not what we want to do. We don't actually, we may want to have overlapping regions, which, uh, uh, which means that the robot can uh, uh, use its, its different potentially contact areas for the robot. So that's not exactly what we're doing here. There are people that they try to represent the environment using this tiny, uh, little planner patches, surfaces, uh, called um, patchlets. Again, this is not different from a dense representation of the environment. There are people that they try to represent the environment using flat areas, flat surfaces, planes. Again, is that good for, uh, for a curved surface? Is that good for a rocky environment? No, obviously. And there is some, some, some work on represent the environment with paraboloids or higher degree polynomials. Uh, again, this work didn't consider uncertainty in the fitting process, uh, the process and didn't have, uh, didn't consider boundaries. What we do here, and the way that I'm gonna show you in a bit how we represent the environment is using bounded curve patches uh, for, uh, for the fitting um, considering uncertainty. And let me go into that. So again, how should, the, qu the main question is how should bipedal robot perceive and model the an unknown rough environment like that one? And the, the intuition comes from humans. When we locomote, we may consider a sparse set of footholds. So instead of, instead of a dense approach, we prefer, we, we thought of representing the environment uh, in a sparse way. And what do I mean by that? Instead of this uh, a dense map, we may want to represent the environment as small, uh, sparse areas, potentially good for contact. And to do that, we need to find a model, a way to model these areas, contact areas between the robot and the environment. Uh, we need to detect them. And of course, we need to maintain a dynamic map of them while the robot is moving in the environment. By the way, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I don't promise I will answer because of time, <laughs> but you should. Uh, okay, so how do we model the environment? In 2011, in IRIS 2011, we introduced these 10 types of um, curved bounded patches. There are mainly paraboloids, second degree polynomials, and a couple non-paraboloids. And to parameterize these, I don't, get, I don't expect you to understand the equations, but how we parameterize this, it's very simple. We use some curvature to, the, to, uh, to parameterize the principal curvature of the parts. We need the pose of the parts in the world with respect to the camera, which uh, can be given from a rotation and translation vector. And of course, we need uh, some parameters for the boundaries. For example, if the boundary is a circle, you just need the radius. Why not? So in 2011, as I said, we introduced this patch modeling for curved bounded to, for curved bounded patches. Their parameters are geometrically meaningful. 
they represent uh, geometric meaningful um, identities and uh, minimal uh, parameterization that we can quantify uncertainty. I mentioned so many times the word uncertainty. What, what do I mean by uncertainty? So there are two types of uncertainty. Uh, there are multiple ways to, um, to uh, define uncertainty. The way we do it here is by uh, using covariance matrices. So there are two types of uncertainty of the input point cloud and the uh, output fitted parts. What you see here in this picture is a range sensor. You can think of a camera here, like a Kinect, a depth camera like Kinect, that senses the environment. Think of this as a simulated surface. You see these little blue dots? These are the points that because the sensor is, is uh, it's not accurate, it, they may appear a little bit off from the, from the environment. The way to represent the uncertainty is you can think the Gaussian in 3D space, it, it's, it becomes an ellipsoid, right? So with probability 95%, this point here that was sensed from the sensor is going to be into that ellipsoid. OK, that's a very quick explanation of what is a covariance matrix in our context. And of course, the output parts, uh, will, uh, the answer will be uh, represented um, in the same way with covariance matrix. I cannot visualize it because it's going to be in the, in the uh, parts parameter space, 8 degrees of freedom, uh, between 8 and 9 degrees of freedom. One more type of uncertainty, outliers, points that are not supposed to be where they are. They appear really off the, of the surface. I'm going to talk about this more later in my slides. So I have a way to model the environment using these 10 bounded patches. So now it becomes the natural question, how do I fit these patches to my data? First of all, my data are going to be a set of 3D points. So I could use, I should use a least square method, right? Why not linear least square method, a typical linear least square method? Because the, the system becomes nonlinear in our case. Why is that? Because we consider uncertainty. So that's a typical uh, minimization of the square, uh, the, the, the sum of squares of the, of the residual, right? For the residual, we weigh its point with its, uns its uncertainty, the input uncertainty, right, with its variance, which means that points that are more uncertain, I'm going to consider less in my, uh, in my uh, fitting. This makes the system nonlinear. We use a typical nonlinear optimization method, the LM method, uh, that you can see um, here. Let me start from the beginning. So the fitting starts like that. There's a range sensor sensing an area. You get some points that represent the area, 3D points. You compute their covariance matrix, their uncertainty. And then with the LM method, you start, you start starting from a plane, you start giving shape to the plane, you start giving curvature. And in the end, after some loops, that gets the, the, surf, the, the, the shape, you fit the boundaries. How do you fit the boundaries? This is a uh, PCA method on the projected to XY plane uh, points. This works. Let me. OK, sorry about this. OK, this method works. It's really fast, this method. It takes only half millisecond per patch for 50 points, um, approximately. What? What I, I'll try to prove you in these videos is that this works for all the type of patches, uh, both in simulation and in uh, real rock. So here you can see that we run the same method for all the all the ten types of patches that I introduced you, and uh, it works pretty pretty good. And here, again, let me start from the beginning. There is a this is a rock we have downstairs in the lab. What I do is that I manually select a set of points in that rock. This is sent from a Kinect, by the way. I manually, set, uh, manually pick a set of points. I press fit, and it fits a patch. And you can see uh, how, uh, how good it, it fits to, to the environment, how nice it represents the environment, which proves that our method is good of representing local areas in the rough terrain. OK? 
Are we done with the uh, Are we done with the fitting? No. After a fitting, after any fitting, you need to evaluate uh, your fitting. How we do that? First, a typical thing when you do any kind of least square fitting, you need to check the residual, the sum of square distances, the geometric residual. Sorry, the sum of square, square distances of each point that, uh, that uh, of each point from the uh, from the uh, from the surface that. Uh, from the parts that uh, it fit, uh, why the residual may be bad? Two reasons: there may be outliers like there, like that, that increase the residual, or since we use the nonlinear optimization algorithm, this may stack in local minima. So uh, patches with big residual, we're gonna consider them as bad patches, and not we're not gonna consider them further in the further in the algorithm. This somehow evaluates the unbounded surface that we fitted, but know that I told you that we fit bound, bounded patches for co contact patches. So I need to evaluate the, bo uh, the, uh, the bounds. The, uh, the, I need to evaluate the patch in terms of the boundaries. How I do that, what I really need is to determine somehow how well distributed are the points, the projected points on the XY plane in the path boundaries. And I do that in a discretized ways. I'm not gonna go into details, but by splitting the paths into cells and counting the number of points in each cell, and uh, depending on some thresholds, I can decide if the path is good or not, okay? So, a third evaluation. And this needs some thought. I'm not gonna go again to too many details. It's hard to explain uh, exactly, but there may be a case where both evaluation pass, but the, the fitting is not good. And this happens when the area is so curved that the curved parts, it doesn't really represent the area. It becomes something like that. So I really need to throw away patches that they have this kind of bad fitting. So hopefully I convinced you that I have a way to represent contact areas between the robot and the environment using using the uh, the surface model that I uh, I introduced you with bounded curved patches. So now the question is how I create uh, a map, a dynamic map of them around the robot that while the robot is moving, it can track these patches uh, that it will come in contact with. First of all, I need to build a map. And this is pretty much the um, this is pretty much the sixth step uh, for building such a map. So first, I'm acquiring some data again, point cloud, and uh, coming from the Kinect and gravity vector coming from the IMU, which is uh, attached on the Kinect. Then I could do some cloud pre-processing. Then an important step is finding seats, finding places, finding points around where I'm gonna fit these patches. Then for each one of these seats, finding the neighborhood of the size of the foot of the robot for, uh, for considering for the fitting, do the fitting and the, and the evaluation. And I'm gonna go into, uh, into each step uh, in detail. So, first step, acquiring data. <coughs> That's nothing new here. Um, I have a Kinect with an IMU. I'm getting 640 by 480 points, around 300,000 points in uh, 30 frames per second. And uh, a gravity vector um, uh, 100 times per second, okay, in 100 hertz. Uh, the only new thing that I want to introduce here is what I call local volumetric workspace. So you can think of that, and you will understand in a bit why we need that, you can think of that as a cubic box in the physical space around the robot. This box could either be fixed in the world, like you can think that this room as, a, as, a, as this cubic box, that the robot could move and get data only in this room but nothing else outside this room, or the volume may move with the robot. Whenever the robot moves, the, molu, the volume moves with the robot, and we only represent data in, in this uh, volume. There are, some, there are some details of how this volume moves and 
all these things there. These are tiny details. Uh, the concept is that you have this volume that only data inside this volume makes sense and nothing else outside. The first reason we use the, the volume is when we do the pre-processing. This is the second step, the pre-processing on the, on the point cloud. So you may want to remove some background areas, some areas that you don't care, some areas that are far away from the robot. So you can set up this volume in some specific size. By the way, I forgot to say that to define this volume, we need the frame of the volume and its size. Okay, so by, by defining uh, a particular size, you may keep only the area and the point cloud you're, that you are really interested in. Uh, you can do that with uh, using some kind of pass-through filters, uh, but it's the same concept. So somehow you can get rid of areas that are that we can consider as background that they are not in our interest. And of course, I told you I'm going to talk about uh, outliers. This is this is one of the parts where we are going to handle outliers in the in the raw uh, point cloud. There are filters like medium filter that it can uh, reduce noise, can reduce outliers. And I can apply this kind of filters at that particular stage. One way or the other, I have a point cloud that I'm gonna work on. So what is the third step of uh, my mapping system? The third step is how I select the seeds. And this is a very crucial step, is where I'm gonna pick the points uh, uh, is the time that I'm going to pick the points around where I'm going to fit the pads, I'm gonna, around where I'm going to fit potentially good contact areas for the robot. The way we use that is uh, using a uniformly random uh, generator for doing that with the only difference. Just using a uniformly random, gen random generator is not going to produce points uniformly random in the in the um, in the whole area, in the whole ground. Why is that? This has to do with the density of the points in the point cloud. So the further the, you move from the camera, the more sparse the points are. So what we, how to, how, uh, uh, you know, a way to handle this is that by using the volumetric space, this cubic sp volumetric space that I, uh, workspace that I, I was talking about, splitting its XZ, um, plane into some cells predefined from the user and considering only uniformly points one per cell. This is going to give me pretty much a well uh, distributed, uniformly distributed points around the whole point cloud. This is a fast method, it's just producing uniformly random uh, points, um, it's general task independent and um, the question is, you know, I'm talking all about contact between a biped while locomoting. So you may wonder why to consider all the area as potentially good for contact. So when you are walking, you don't consider the, the wall as a good area for contact. You are never going to try to find the seat point on the wall. And you're right. So how we handle this? So in uh, iCraft 14, uh, two months ago, I presented this paper that we have on real-time bio-inspired saliency select, seed point selection. So, since the task is very particular, which is bipedal hiking in rough rocky terrain, I can, uh, I can try to find saliency points uh, to fit foot scale curve patches in the environment. And how to do that? We introduce a bio-inspired method for analyzing human subject footholds. That's me, the human subject. Uh, while hiking on rocks uh, with respect to the location, to their curvature, and to, the, and to its orientation. I'm going to explain you how we did that. First of all, I need to define what is saliency for our task. We have four measures of saliency. The first one, I called it, we called it distance to estimated fixation point. This comes from a biomechanical property of humans that um, we tend to fixate uh, two steps ahead one while we're hiking. This, there is a, a set of papers mainly published in neuroscience that uh, they proved this uh, kind of biomechanical properties of humans 
And they're right. Instead of considering the full environment for finding sin points, the, what we can do is that find this fixation point, we can, we can see as a blue dot there, and consider only, only the points in some fixed distance from this fixation point. That makes sense. A second, uh, a second um, measure is, uh, is what we call difference of normal gravity vectors. What I mean by that, we have the gravity vector coming from the IMU, and you have the normal vectors for each point in the point cloud. The ankle, what does it represent? It represents the slope of the area around this point. So what is this difference of normal gravity is mainly the slope of this area for each point. What I can do is I consider salient points, points with small uh, angle between the gravity and the, the normal vector. So the more um, perpendicular to the gravity the, the ground is, the better, right? It's better the floor than the, the wall for walking. I think this makes sense as well. A third and more interesting property measure that we use, the same measure, is what we call difference of multi-scale normals. What we did is that we found the normal vector of, for each point in the point cloud in two different scales. The angle between these two normals for a particular point gives me a measure of the how irregular is the area around that point. For instance, in that case, we had the flat ground. The two normals are the same, the two in two different scales. Whereas here, we had the irregular ground. The two normals tend to uh, create an angle between them. And we consider a salient points, those that they have low angle between uh, to these normals. Why is that helpful for us? Think what kind of patches we have to fit to our environment. They are parabolas, they are second degree polynomials. So they have, whereas they are uh, designed to model rough terrain in a local scale, the more regular they are, there is the, there is the, is the surface, the better for us, for the fitting part. So that's a very interesting and nice property uh, that we figured out of using. And last but not least, you can consider curvatures. How curved is the surface? Is it flat? Is more curved? And this, the saliency for this, to consider if this is a good area or not in terms of uh, curvature, it really depends on the robot. So a robot like human that we have flat feet, we may consider uh, areas with low curvature, planes or like areas with uh, some low curvature. Feet, like the big, do uh, sorry, th like the little dog that they were more uh, spherical, you may want to consider a little bit more high curvature areas. Okay? So, the question now, because this is kind of a filtering in the original point cloud, is how we set up the thresholds. I, I say here low curvature, low angle, what is this number, what is low? And this is where we used humans. So we went five humans, including me, Marty, his wife, <laughs> Alper, and one more person, and we hiked, uh, um, uh, we hiked uh, uh, for, in six trails, uh, 10 meter each, and what we did is we uh, uh, grabbed the, uh, we had the camera uh, tracking our, our foot, and in the same time we had a Kinect with an IMU uh, getting the RGBD and IMU data on each trail. And what we did is we went manually in each frame and we found where the human stepped on in the point cloud. We manually fitted a patch in the same area that human selected for locomotion. And we gathered some, um, uh, some statistics about these areas. What are the statistics have to do with the measures that I just introduced? So we uh, checked what is the curvatures, 
the mean and max curvatures of these areas, what is the slope angle, and what is the difference between the two uh, normal, uh, the, the, between, uh, what is the angle between the two normals. And what we did and how we set the threshold, it was by simply setting to the corresponding average plus minus some, uh, some variance. And by that, we managed to reproduce statistically similar patches to what humans are, um, are selecting when they're locomoting. And b b before that, why this is helpful? Because like that, from the total point cloud, I can now consider only areas that they pass these statistics. So I'm not going to consider areas on the wall anymore for seed point selection. I'm not going to consider areas that they have a big, uh, a big slope or a big curvature. One way or the other, we can select some seed points using the bio-inspired method or using or just by doing a uniformly random sampling. Next question is, OK, I have this seed points. The number of seed points, it depends on multiple things, on your time that you want to feed, on uh, the representation of the environment, etc. The next question is, how can I find a neighborhood in the point cloud for each one of these? What is the size of the neighborhood? The size of the neighborhood is the size of the foot of the robot. So it is the areas that you, are cons you will consider for contact. This is a very well-known problem, finding neighborhoods in uh, point clouds. Uh, we tested three different methods, KD3, mesh triangulation, back projection, and I'm not going to go into details, but the differences, and we did some experiments that I'm not going to show you today because of time issues, but um, the, the difference between these two met three methods sorry, has to do mainly with the timing. So, for instance, back projection is very fast for organized point cloud, uh, and but also has to do with the jump. So one method it doesn't it doesn't consider uh, uh, it doesn't consider so it takes care of the jumps between two rocks, for example. So it's not gonna go through the jump if you have two different rocks. Whereas the other, unfortunately, it goes through the jumps. And we ran some experiments on that that I'm not going to show you today, but we tried all these methods. One way or the other, again, using any of these three methods, you can have a neighborhood for its seed point. And what you want to do, as I introduced you in the first part, is fitting patches that you see in this video here in the area and evaluate them with respect to residual coverage and curvature. Uh, you can see some evaluation here. You see why this is evaluated as a bad patch because the points are not well distributed in the patch. What is the patch map now? How it looks like? This is how it looks like. So what we did the, here is that we use the bio-inspired method, the one that I introduced you uh, a few slides ago, to select only areas that uh, humans would select for navigation. And I fit it uh, patches. Uh, random patches to uh, to this area and what you can see here here you can see hundred hundred uh, random patches fitted in the environment a very nice uh, and here you can see the the nice result of the bio inspired method is that you don't see patches further away which means that uh, not further away from the fixation point that humans tend to look uh, at um, you don't see patches in very curved areas in the environment. No patches with high curvature because we consider flat fit uh, for, uh, for humans and robots. And because of the property of the multi-scale uh, normals, uh, that's a good thing that we didn't have too many bad fittings. We didn't have to throw away too many patches in terms of fitting. And that's, and that's very nice because we saved a lot of time uh, for, uh, uh, from bad feeling. The most interesting thing is that we can do that really fast. <coughs> we can fit 700 patches per second. Not that we tend to fit 700 patches per second, but 
uh, what we want of it is to find reasonable, uh, to reasonably sample the world, uh, the environment, uh, with some quality patches there uh, that they are good in contact for contact um, in real time. One more nice thing and outcome of this uh, of this type of uh, parameterization and modeling of the environment is that now from the dense approach, the one that the other robots were using, like now in HRP2, where you represent the environment with uh, a half megabyte uh, using point clouds, now I have contact areas, 100 patches, let's say, per frame, that you can only represent with 3 kilobytes. That helps a lot uh, with the performance of the algorithms. So now I have a map, and I explained to you how we find a map of these patches in a single frame. But the robot is moving, right? And you need to track this kind of patches. How do you do that? What is tracking? How do you track patches? How do you know that the patch that was here while you are moving is it's this one? You should think in a different way. You should think that patch tracking is like Actually, it's, main, it's mainly like tracking the camera with respect to a, uh, to a fixed point, with respect to a fixed frame, right? So if you are able to track the camera, and since you know the original position of the patch with respect to the camera during the fitting, then you always, while the camera is moving, if you can track the camera, you always know uh, the patch location. And this is a very well studied problem. Uh, people study this in, 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 in the context of, uh, of SLAM or uh, 6D visual odometry. These are, uh, this is like a very, they're keep, there is a lot of research on that. Um, the only issue that we may face here, which may be different than the other approaches, is that when the robot is moving, there are a lot of shakes. So when the robots, when these humanoids are moving, there are a lot of shakes in the camera. And you should make sure that these shakes don't um, ruin somehow the tracking process. So which method did we use for uh, camera tracking? We used the moving volume Kinect Fusion method. I'm not sure if you have heard about the Kinect Fusion uh, uh, paper. It's a great paper. It's like introduced in 2011. Lots of citations. Lots of people are using it. So what, what is the original method doing is that it integrates depth maps while the, while the camera is moving into a TSDF representation using a cubic volume, a fixed cubic volume around the robot. And now you see the connection and now you see why I introduced my volume in a similar way. This helps a lot. That was in a fixed phase. Marty with Henry uh, a couple of years ago, they improved the system by, for our purposes, for our application, by introducing this vo vo moving volume. So the volume now is not in a fixed position as the original method, but it moves with the robot. Here you can see, uh, so there are two nice things about this approach of tracking. First, first you can do the tracking uh, using a, a generalized ICP method uh, in real time. It is implemented in uh, GPUs. So it becomes real time, it's a very nice implementation and you can always have the pose of the camera, the six degree of freedom position of the camera with respect to the volume frame. Another nice thing is that, as I said here, it integrates depth map. So you see here, here you see some rocks. You see how nice it integrates the information. Even if there are holes, they're starting, you see like they start feeding with new um, new point cloud uh, while you are moving, which which is a really nice property of this system. We had to do two, uh, two, uh, two extra things to use uh, this system uh, to our robot. First thing is what, oh, by the way, um, and I forgot, the way you do, you take a point cloud from this system is by doing a ray casting from the real camera. So this TSDF representation represents somehow the environment in this cubic volume, uh, and then you ray cast and you find a, a point cloud uh, for, for this uh, for the for the surface around around the camera. 
what we did instead of using the real camera ray casting is that we introduced this virtual camera that lives above the robot. Why we do that? So when we are walking, when robots may when robots are walking, they look there. They look in, in, in front of them, right? Or a little bit down. But you don't look on your feet when you are walking. But we need to fit patches around the robot and under the feet. So with this way of introducing this, visual, uh, this virtual camera above the robot, we have a way to have a point cloud really around the robot, even under its feet. Second thing, to apply this thing, you need to, and since the, the moving volume is moving with the robot, you need to use the IMU sensor for, uh, for the moving policies of the volume. So, instead of having the volume moving as the camera is moving, this will definitely break the ray casting, the ray casting uh, for, uh, for the environment. What we do is that we fixate the, the y-axis of the volume to be parallel always to the gravity vector, which means that no matter how the robot is going to move, the volume is going to be always the y uh, axis of the volume is going to be always parallel to the uh, to the gravity, which means that the ray casting is going to be still valid even if the robot looks down or do any other kind of moves. A result that we got using this patch mapping and tracking system, you can see it here. I'm going to show more videos uh, in the next slide, but here you can see how nice this system works. First of all, you can see that there are no big holes in the point cloud. And this comes from the fact that we, f from two things. First, because the original moving volume Kinect Fusion integrates information. And second, I believe because of the virtual camera that you look the environment from above and not from, uh, from the real camera. You see how nice and smooth the area looks. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, uh, this is the same rocky environment that we hiked during the, uh, the bio-inspired method uh, um, experiments. The other thing that you can see is that you see here it's in frame 83 and this is in a later frame. You see that you can really track patches. You can see it visually that you can really track patches while the camera is moving. So hopefully I, I convinced you that we have a very nice, we introduced a very nice mapping and tracking system for curved patches to represent contact. How do we apply this to our, uh, to our robot? How am I doing in terms of time? Uh, we started about seven minutes late, so I think you have about another seven minutes. Good. RPBP. So, this is uh, the <laughs> robot that <laughs> I was waiting for this moment. Okay. So those people that came in proposal, now it's more exciting, I think. This is designed mainly by Marty uh, over the last uh, few years. Um, it's a mini humanoid. It's that big. Uh, it's 12 degrees of freedom. This is a 3D model. All the parts are 3D printed in the 3D printer. We have downstairs, six degrees of freedom for each leg. I'm not gonna go, per each, uh, sorry, foot, a uh, leg. I'm not gonna go into details. It has a Carmin 109 as the range sensor. This is very similar to a Kinect, but it has a sor shorter range, range uh, for viewing and an IMU attached on it. In the first experiment, I wanted to, to, to check if the patch mapping and tracking uh, system is working independently of the control. So I let the robot that you see up there just moving, just walking slowly in the environment uh, with a predefined motion. And I want to check if the tracking system is breaking at any point. And it doesn't. And this is very good. And this was a very simple experiment just to prove that all the shakes that you see how, how the robot shakes while it's moving naturally, this doesn't break the tracking system. And that's very good. This means that we can track and have a patch mapping. Uh, a dynamic patch map uh, system um, 
not represent the environment in a very nice way. So, second experiment, I need to I need to check how I can do how I can use these contact areas uh, for uh, placing my foot on the on the rock. We used our apparatus here is a table. We have downstairs again. It has three rocks in uh, uh, some fixed positions. They are solid rocks. And what we do is that we place our robot in front of its rock in a predefined position. And we want to see how we can use the paths mapping and tracking system for uh, placing the foot. I'm not going to do a full walking task, but just finding a good path and placing my foot uh, on this path. How do I do that? In two steps. First is the training step. So this thesis again is not, uh, it's not focused on con in control, in control. So I'm going to use a very simple control system. What we did is that we let RPBP uh, sit in a look down position, we call it. So it looks down like that. And from the point cloud, we fit manually a patch in the area that I would like to place my foot on. And then we train manually with our hands, with, sorry, with, uh, yeah, with our hands in a, in a sequence of, uh, of uh, motions, the robot to place its foot on its rock, depending on which rock it is and what's, which patch rock it is. That's the training part. It's a, that's a very simple control system for checking our perception system, which is the main focus of this thesis. So the experiment goes like that. So first, uh, we place the robot in, front, in front of a rock. We let it look down. And we let it create a dynamic patch map, as I explained in my whole thesis, in my whole talk right now, right? Fitting patches, evaluating them, tracking them, okay. And then, with the only difference here, is that instead of having this random or bio-inspired seat points, I'm going to consider as seat points only those points that are five centimeters from the center of its trained patch. Why I do that? This is mainly because the control system <coughs> is simple. So we would like to make it a little bit easier for the robot. I could go and start fitting more patches around the robot. This is just a simple way of uh, avoiding. Uh, it's a side effect of not having a very advanced control system. And then while the robot is here and has fitted some patches around, it checks if, it, if a patch, any of the patches in the map, is similar to a patch that it was trained for. And if it does, it, uh, it makes the corresponding move. And I'm going to show you, while I'm talking, I'm going to show you the video of, of the experiments. Here you see that the robot looked down. It started creating patches. It found the correct patch, patch of the rock number one, and it, it made the corresponding move. Not only that, but you can see how nice the tracking part worked. You can see that the robot was moving while it was making the step. And finally, you have, you track it in a nice way that the patch really meets the foot, which means that the tracking system is working really nice in our case. Same for rock two. It realizes it's not rock two. Now, it, instead of the left leg, it uh, raised the right leg, and it, uh, it makes the move for the... Um, for the uh, corresponding rock, rock number two. Note that this, these videos are in real time. It's not sped up like the previous videos that I show you from the related work. It's a very nice system. What I did is that I ran this experiment, I should have here, at least 20 times per rock uh, uh, and worked perfectly. I didn't fail, uh, never. What do I mean by failure here? by failure in the perception part, because this is what I care about, is when you place it on, uh, in front of a rock and that it knows about, and it should detect it and move, and either doesn't find it, the corresponding path, or it finds a wrong corresponding path. 
this never happened to our system for, uh, for our tries. And let me conclude with some future work. First of all, as Marty said, I'm moving to IIT in Italy, starting in September, for uh, being a, a part of the Walkman European project. Uh, I will be leading the perception and uh, whole body affordances. Uh, I will be there in, in that group. Uh, and what I'm going to mainly try is to apply what I have done here in RPBP in, uh, in their robot that, again, as you can see, people that they were doing control, they don't have a head, <laughs> not even in the picture. <laughs> so, ah, only simulation, it doesn't have eyes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I'm very happy for that, I'm very excited. Uh, I think it's gonna be great. Uh, so I showed you a very simple control system right now with predefined motions and everything, but with these people, in IIT, I believe we can have a more advanced control and path planning uh, method using inverse kinematics and some ZMP probably balancing methods for uh, uh, really driving motions from the parts itself and be, uh, without having to train uh, the robot uh, for that. Uh, I would be, for the tracking method, again, I'm excited because these robots, they don't have a GPU on them, so usually you need to find some other kind of methods for uh, tracking. Uh, I think I, I'm gonna work on that uh, over the last few months. And uh, one nice thing that I want to do, I introduced you uncertainty in this talk, but I didn't talk much about uncertainty. Uh, it's because we didn't do too much about uncertainty. So we have the uncertainty of the fitted parts, but we don't do much about this. And I would like to see how I can apply uncertainty in locomotion, how I can play with the uh, motor compliances and how I can uh, use uncertainty for fusing data uh, uh, during the, the locomotion. So my last slide, and now I hope it makes more sense to you than the first, uh, the first time you see that, is my whole system that I designed during this uh, past three or four years. Uh, with Marty, um, it's split it in two parts, as I said. Upper part, mapping and tracking using patches. A set of potentially good patches for contact is sent to the control system and the robot using a library of, of trained patches. It goes and it, uh, if it finds a similar one, it moves and does uh, the corresponding uh, move on the robot. And with that, I'm going to accept questions. Before that, I'd like to thank you all for coming again. That's probably the last time you hear me speaking <laughs> <laughs> in this room. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I had some bad and good times uh, here at Northeastern. <laughs> Northeastern. <laughs> uh, but um, I feel like... Uh, I met so many good friends here, especially the second floor, which I was the last six years. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, there are some people that I would like to thank more because they're like more like brothers to me than friends. Christos is one, Pavel, Alper, Aras, and uh, that's it for me. And I, I would like to thank Marty for being my advisor. It was too risky for taking a guy doing game theory and try to teach him robotics. I think we did a good job. Uh, I hope at least. We'll see in uh, half an hour. <laughs> so, and thanks the committee. I hope the guys are still on Skype. <laughs> Maybe not. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> if I at least this. Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, okay. So well, thanks. Thank thanks you. a lot. And or the committee. It should be a defense, so you should be. <laughs> Just make the questions I gave you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please go ahead. This means that either you didn't understand anything or you understood everything. And I hope none of this is true. Okay. Uh, yeah. I have a, a question about your patches. I mean, so, so you said that you. 
collected like fewer thousand of different patches, no? No. So in each frame, mm -hmm. so the number of patches is, is kind of crucial on how you pick the number of patches. So what is the... No, no, I mean, so, so when, when you train the collection, when you build the collection. Oh, right. So, uh, no, uh, that's just for patches. We mm -hmm. use just for patches for the training. So to do this, these patches belong actually to a class of, uh, to one of the 10 classes that you no. described earlier, so like uh, parabolas? I, uh, I, think I, I think I understood the question. I think that the question is if, if the, the way that we train the robot for particular patches can be extending for some kind of similar patches in the world, right? Is, is, this, is this the question? Uh, uh, not really. So uh, you, you said that you, uh, you consider it like uh, a lot of different patches, but do they still belong to the family I mean, of, oh, yeah. of paraboloids? Yes. Uh, yes. Whenever we fit mm -hmm. patches, mm -hmm. is using the model that we introduce in the first part of the talk of fitting patches. And this is by design. So mm -hmm. we do that. We fit uh, second degree polynomials. Se se second degree. Bounded, degree. Ba bounded mm -hmm. parabola. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, 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 so oh. the only difference are those are, are the parameters of, of those uh, Exactly. The curvature and the boundaries. Okay, thanks. Mainly. Um, so you mentioned a lot about how once you've mapped out the environment, you're just tracking the camera changes and you already know what the environment looks like. How could this be extended to changing environments? Oh, so right. like if there's a rock slide or exploring robots right. or moving things. Okay, so, good question. So, I forgot to say that the whole design we did here is for um, static environments. And we didn't really work on dynamic environments where things are changing. So, but, but, first of all, you fit new patches in each frame, right? So, actually, it doesn't matter if the environment moves, since at some point you're going to fit uh, new, uh, new patches in the new environment. What happens with the old patches that they used to represent the environment? You may have a way, probably using validation, the same kind of validation here, like the patches with respect to residual or coverage, all this stuff, to throw away these patches. We don't do that here, but I guess it's probably it's easy to extend it uh, in that way. This is this uh, with respect to the paths, uh, to the mapping part. With respect to the tracking part, indeed, Kinect Fusion, I think it assumed a static environment, but again, as I said, Kinect Fusion is not the only way to, um, to do the tracking part. And, uh, and I'm very interested in that. I, I, lots of people are doing uh, a big amount of research on how you do tracking in dynamic environments, in static environments, environments that are changing, etc. Even uh, Microsoft with Kinect, they're very interested. That Actually, this, this Kinect fusion is very uh, related to, to Microsoft uh, research. They do, um, they investigate methods of tracking uh, using uh, in dynamic environments. So I believe that the mapping part, you can do it using the same system in dynamic uh, change uh, environment. The tracking part, I, I, right now I cannot think of uh, too many ways, but uh, I'm sure there are, uh, there are ways that you can handle dynamic uh, environments for that. Yes. So you don't... Uh when you when you're doing your sampling, you don't utilize any of the previous information, right? Pre from previous slides. What do you mean by that? So I mean, you have all these patches you've created in the previous frame, and then you're redoing it in the current. No, frame, right? okay, good question. So no, I'm keeping the patches. First of all, I'm keeping the patches, and if they need, if you need to add more, I do it in the next frame. So I'm tracking the patches that I used to have in the previous frame, and if needed in the new frame, I'm adding more. What do I mean by that? It's very easy to understand here. So here the camera is here and it only detected this part of the world, right? So you fit it patches here. And you move the next frame. So in the next frame, probably you will have some point clouds here, some new one coming. You will track those that you fit it here, but also you are, since you have new 
possible uh, good points for seed for finding seeds and fitting patches, you are gonna do that. So yes, you keep all the previous patches that you fitted already uh, and creating new. You also throw away patches. And actually, I didn't say that, and I forgot it in both of my practice talks. <laughs> and still, I didn't mention that. That um, here it is. So you see, here we we let the robot to throw away all patches that are behind the camera. So you see, when the robot is moving, when the you will see it now, when the robot is moving. It throws away patches. So yeah, you can like you keep a dynamic. You see how patches are thrown away that they are left behind because you may want to consider only patches in front of you for potential contact. So yeah, you have a way to keep all the patches that you had in the previous frame, a way to track them, a way to find new ones, and ways to throw away those that are not useful anymore. So you are doing seeding based on. What, you, what information you Exactly. Have. Exactly. More questions? So, um, uh, so, so in the uncertainty, uh, so, so e each of, so, so we have a point cloud and we fit the surface to a neighborhood in the point cloud. Um, and uh, we said that each of the points in the point cloud had an associated uh, Covariance matrix. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then and then we said that the surface that we were fitting was going to have some associated uncertainty as well. Yes. And we were going to um, calculate that based on the covariance matrix of in the, the points. points. Exactly. Uh, the uncertainty in the surface is um, in the parameters of the surface. Yes. So 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 it's like it's like a Gaussian yes. in the parameters of surface. Yes. So 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 there's like ten parameters in the yes. in the surface. So it's a ten-dimensional Gaussian. Yes. Exactly. And so how, how we do that is simple. Uh -huh. Not simple. It's not simple, but <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. It's, just, it's not simple. We tried <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yes, so you have a convergence matrix per, per point and how to find this, this is another question. There is work from other papers that we use to find this convergence matrix per each point. The LM algorithm, when it's doing the fitting, it gives you a covariance matrix of whatever it fits. But with the LM, we fit it an unbounded surface, right? So we had to, uh, to propagate the uncertainty from the unbounded surface to the bounded one. So we did kind of, uh, right? Yeah, uh, we did the uh, uncertain propagation to find the final 10-dimensional or 8-dimensional uh, covariance matrix that represent the bounded, the uncertainty of the bounded parabola or bounded curve surface. So I guess what I was going to ask was, uh, um, we represent the uncertainty of the surface, and we're saying we're going to do it with the Gauss with the Gaussian over the parameters. Um, is that the best way that you think to represent the uncertainty of the surface? I mean, you know, like the relationship between what the between the parameters and what the surface looks like might be non-intuitive. Exactly, you are right on that, and I cannot I don't have a clear answer on that because we never used the. Uh, outcome uncertainty, the final convergence, 10, di 10 dimensional convergence at anything. Our original idea was that this will be part of a slum system or a fusion system that conver covariance matrix is what is used for these systems. So our idea was uh, we'll fit, and, and this is like a future work that we're going to fit a patch here, it, it's going to have an associate covariance matrix, and then uh, when I'm gonna refit the same parts now, because I, I don't refit here, I just track them, but our original idea with that was that we will refit at some point to make it better. Uh, I'm gonna use the new convariance matrix with the old one to fuse the data. That's why we picked the convariance matrix as... Um, also, 
tell them about algebraic versus geometric parameterization, right? Because that pertains to this question. Right? We choose these algebraic param uh, geometric parameters, right? Why do you do that? Versus the algebraic parameters. Well, I don't know what the difference between those two is. You could tell them. Yeah. So Can you tell them what the difference is between the algebraic <laughs> and geometric parameters of the patch? So the way you're using paraboloids, uh -huh. In your work is uh, oh, sorry, that's not is uh, it has to do with the equation, right? Uh, you do the typical a x squared plus b x plus c mm -hmm. equals zero. We don't do that kind of parameterization. This is an algebraic par par parameterization. We the 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 equation for uh, exp for uh, expressing our parameters is geometrically meaning. This is what is the second one. So we represent using curvature, using uh, the poles in the wall and uh, boundary. So this is irrelevant somehow in the, in the so this okay, also Okay, so so it's so it's it's Gaussian in these these geometric parameters exactly. rather than the algebraic parameters. Yes. So they have a meaning some no so yeah the the question again we were, we had some brief discussion over these years of how we do the projections of this confines matrix to find only you know how to use only like the uncertainty in the curvature because you can have you have this big confines matrix the upper like two by two will be the confines of the curvature etc etc so you have you have a you have an intuition of what are this uh, what is this uncertainty we just didn't use it so far for our uh, to our method and this is a very to me it's very interesting future work uh, of how to do that it uh, yeah so how do you get the boundary so, how do you so the boundary? point cloud yeah. i fit a surface an unbounded surface when you fit a paraboloid you fit an unbounded paraboloid which has a local frame x x y z I project my points to the x y z, uh, as to the x y plane, so I have something like that, yeah. and then I do a principal component analysis on that. Right? Think about fitting an ellipse. It, it has some like uh, differences and uh, some details there that I'm. I'm, I'm you should check the paper for that, but what you mainly do is a PCA method on finding the principal uh, directions and um, uh, sizes in the principal uh, uh, directions of, uh, of this So the, ellipse. the boundary is always an ellipse then? Well, no. it, it's, it's, like the pre, it's like an ellipse in three right, dimension. Right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah, right. Any more questions or should we move to the closed session? Okay, let's go for the closed session then. Thank you all. Thank you. Should they leave the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Give them out, we'll prove uh, them. Maybe we should turn the camera off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me see if they're, they're both here. Okay, they're both here.